Again, we're thankful for all those who are here. We appreciate you coming out tonight and do encourage as we always do to follow along as we study the Bible. And if you have questions, we'd be more than happy to open up our Bibles and give you a Bible answer for those questions you might have. You know, we hear a phrase that uh, almost been on the news, the radio, various sources for about two years now, and it's just simply called follow the science, and we're told to follow the science. You know, we hear that repeatedly from conservatives, from liberals, from doctors, from just about everybody, they all just follow the science. And so it's real interesting when you hear all the different things because one scientist says one thing and another scientist says something different, and so which science do you follow? You know, it's kind of hard to pick out when there's so many conflicting voices in science, so-called, uh, to determine, well, which one would I follow if I'm going to follow the science? When we look at the word science, if you just look at the definition, it's the state of knowing, knowledge, as distinguished from ignorance or misunderstanding. So just the word science is talking about knowledge, about knowing, and so when you follow the knowledge, you're talking about something that would be factual, something that you could look at from the facts and determine is truth, therefore you should follow that or go that direction. Another part of the definition says a knowledge or a system of knowledge covering general truths or the operation of general laws, especially as obtained and tested through scientific method. And so uh, when you talk about arriving at knowledge, arriving at the truth, uh, they talk, use this term scientific method. We use a method of testing and testing, and after so many tests and you get the results are the same so many times, then you can pretty well rest assured, well, that's truth. That's knowledge. We can agree on that. Uh, the scientific method simply is principles and procedures for the systematic pursuit of knowledge involving the recognition and formulation of a problem, the collection of data through observation and experiment, and the formulation and testing of hypotheses. And so when you look at the scientific method, you test it, you test it, you test it, you get the same answer every time, eventually you decide that's the truth. But if you test it once and get one answer, and test it again and get a different answer, uh, well, then you can't decide. You, that, that may not be the truth. You're not sure. And so you keep testing. You keep trying different variables to maybe arrive at what we think of as knowledge. When, I, when you think about following the science, you know, uh, think about evolution, for example. Something came from nothing. That's the basic doctrine of evolution. You think about the scientific method. You think about testing. Now, this is an accepted fact by many scientists today, not all scientists, but many scientists. They speak as if evolution is a proven fact, and yet uh, you cannot prove it. You cannot test it. Uh, there's no way to use the scientific method to determine something. At best, it's just a guess, and of course, uh, when you think about evolution, what they look at is, you know, the earth uh, just blew up one day, or rather nothing blew up, and they call that the Big Bang, and the Big Bang produced the galaxies that we have, the solar systems, the earth as we see it, everything just sort of fell into place, and uh, gradually over billions of years, well, eventually, somehow, life came out of nothing. And so, uh, when you look at it, it's interesting. This past week, I was listening on the radio, and some scientist, I don't know who he was, because I wasn't paying that good of attention until he used the word Big Bang. He said, yes, the Big Bang happened 14 billion years ago. And, I mean, he just stated it like it's a fact. And uh, I thought, well, well, maybe it was 15 billion you know, or 13 billion, but no, it's 14 billion years ago was the Big Bang. And so uh, all of a sudden these gases, which where did the gases come from? We don't know. You know, everything about it cannot be proved. There's nothing that can be proved about it. And yet they speak of it as if it's fact. 
And so if you follow the science with evolution, you're not going to have to go very far because there's no science to it whatsoever. It's just one guess after another guess after another guess. And then you think back, there was a time when scientists and a lot of people, because they believed scientists, thought the earth was flat. Yeah. You know, if you just kind of look at it, if you didn't know any better, it seemed to be flat. You know, you just really don't really know. But we grew up in a world where we were taught it was round. We were taught about planets. We, we've seen models of the globe, models of the solar system. We all don't even think about it. It's round, and we understand that. It's just like a big ball. And so we know that it's round, but yet there was a time when science said that it was flat. But science was wrong. And again, you go back to that term, knowledge. Well, it was false knowledge. They, maybe they were giving it their best thoughts, but they were still wrong no matter how sincere they may have been when they thought of the earth as being flat. And then you come to another one. We talk about in the 1960s. We're getting a little to where, to where most of us or some of us can remember back in the 60s. I knew I was in grade school and high school in the 60s, so I remember some of these things. And in the 60s, there was a big push for global cooling. And the thing about global cooling was it was going to create, uh, there was going to be a problem because of overpopulation, and there were going to be mass examples of starvation around the world. And uh, the leading scientists of the day, well, they were convinced we were just going to freeze to death, to death that we were going into an ice age. Earth Day, 1970, there was a lot of predictions, and these predictions were made, again, by the elite of our society, just like we've always had elite. These are all scholars. I'm going to quote from some of them here. I've got many more quotes. I'm only going to use a couple here as an example, but the idea is these were the men that were considered the most brilliant men at some of the most brilliant institutions of the day and even of today as well. Paul Ehrlich, who was a, at Stanford University, he was a biologist, he said air pollution is certainly going to take hundreds of thousands of lives in the next few years alone. And so he just makes that statement. It's a, a fact that's what's going to happen because of air pollution. And then Another fellow by the name of Kenneth Watt, an ecologist, said the world has been chilling sharply for about 20 years. If present trends continue, the world will be about 4 degrees colder for the global mean temperature in 1990, but 11 degrees colder in the year 2000. This is about twice what it would take to put us into an ice age. Now notice that these are scientists. These are men, and they're stating these things as facts. And they're, they're making these broadcasts. You can read these. You can find these quotes from this Earth Day uh, back in 1970 as they made these various predictions. Another one, Dr. S. Dylan Ripley, secretary of the Smithsonian Institute, believes that in 25 years, somewhere between 75 and 80 percent of all the species of living animals will be extinct. And a fellow named Senator Gaylord Nelson, Democrat in Wisconsin, was quoting this fellow Ripley. And so uh, you look at this idea, here's a doctor, and I guess it's some sort of PhD. I don't think he was a medical doctor, but he claims that in 25 years, 75 to 80 percent. That's interesting because these are all wrong. They're not even close to right. But you don't hear anybody today going back and saying, hey, look how wrong these guys were. How do we know the guys today are right if these guys were that wrong? And yet, that was what, what we were being told back in 1970. Goes on over in Life magazine, January of 70, says scientists, now this is interesting, have solid experimental and theoretical evidence to support the following predictions. In a decade, urban dwellers will have to wear gas masks to survive air pollution. By 1985, air pollution will have reduced the amount of sunlight reaching the earth by one half. 
In 10 years, that's going to take place. Now again, they were making these predictions before crowds of people, before reporters. There were people like all of your news media was discussing these things at the time and talking about them. And so this was big news back then about the earth and the climate and things that were taking place, things that were going to happen. Kenneth Watt goes on to say, by the year 2000, if present trends continue, we'll be using up crude oil at such a rate there won't be any more crude oil. Now, we're using crude oil more than we've ever used crude oil. And it's interesting when you start listening to people in the oil industry that they don't know how much oil's in this earth and that they keep finding oil, they keep finding ways to get more out of the earth, and yet here's people back, you know, 50 years ago who were making prediction we were going to be completely out of crude oil, and yet we're not. You ever stop to think why we're not out of crude oil? I, I thought about that, how much we use, whatever, because God knows what we need. God put in this earth the things that we need to sustain life on this earth. And, and so God knew nothing, nothing escapes God. He knows we need crude oil. He knows because of the population and the, the type of things that we have to do to farm and other things like that, we would need crude oil. We'd need sources of energy and things of that nature. Well, the Lord knew that. And yet these people, most of these people... I'd say they don't believe in God whatsoever. And so the, God doesn't enter into their thinking, you see, when they begin to make predictions like this. And so every one of them's wrong. It reminds me of what we're taught in Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy says, if a man makes a prophecy and it fails to come through, that he's a false prophet. Well, that tells you all of these fellows are false prophets. They all made prophecies and none of them came true. Now, you go from the global cooling in the 60s to global warming in the 90s. Isn't it amazing? They just kind of forget one thing and shift it over to something else. So in the 90s, we're going to burn the earth up. And so we have a, another set of oh, what we might call the elite, the knowledgeable of our day. And they make uh, failed predictions as well. Ted Danson, a famous actor, and so we know he's really smart. He predicts the oceans would be dead in 10 years. Now that was in 1988. Well, now a few of you went out in the ocean just the other day. Was it dead? Lots of living stuff in the ocean. A lot of dolphins too, weren't they? And so when you look at it, they make a prediction and just go right on. 2007, 8, and 9, Al Gore predicts that the Arctic will be ice-free by 2013. We know what a famous scientist Al Gore is. Well, Gore was simply echoing the predictions made by an American scientist, Vishla Maslaus, in 2007, who said that you can argue that maybe our projection of an ice-free Arctic by 2013 is already too conservative. Well, it's nine years past that, and there's still ice in the Arctic. So again, you see... They make these predictions, we're killing ourselves, and of course the answer to all of these things, they need more money. Well, if the earth's burning up, or if the earth's going to freeze, what money going to do with it? But they figure if they tax us enough, somehow all of this will stop and turn around, but the, the idea is, they make a lot of predictions, and the news media promotes these things, and politicians just glam onto those things, and before long, a lot of people just kind of accept them. They don't really examine them. They don't really think about it. They're not reminded that these things took place and that they all failed. And so uh, life goes on and people think maybe there is something to this global warming stuff. And then that didn't work out too well in the past, so now it's just climate change. And so it's not warming, it's not cooling, it's just climate change. And of course, we're the problem, and gasoline's the problem, but according to them, gasoline was supposed to be out by now anyway. But gasoline's the problem, or something like that. And so today it's just climate change. And as a result of that, we've got to do away with oil and gas and coal. 
we've got to all get, get rid of all of that because somehow or another that's going to change the climate. Well, you know, I've been living here over 60 years and the climate changes all the time. Sometimes it's cold, sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's mild, and climate's around. What can you do about the climate? What can any of us do to raise the temperature or lower the temperature or change the climate whatsoever? If you see a storm coming, can you go out and stop it? Will any amount of tax money stop it? Can any politician or any scientist stop it? No. They, they can only talk about it. They can talk about it and use that as one of their issues, but that's what they're doing. They, they make these predictions and they all fail. Then we had the China virus came along a couple of years ago. Uh, no social gatherings, no church, can't go to church services. But you can keep the gaming hall, the casino open down here on exit two in Franklin. And you can go in there and you can sit right next to somebody and pull that slot machine. But you can't go sit in a church service. You can go to Lowe's, you can go to Home Depot, you can go to Kroger, you can get in the aisles with any number of people and that's fine but you can't go to church service. You can't have a gathering like that. And they say singing's real bad for you, so don't sing when you get together. And, and so no social gatherings like that. Don't have people into your homes even. Don't even have family gatherings. And yet, you can go anywhere you want as far as a, a big chain store is, a Walmart or something like that. But don't go in your little store down on the, on the square down there where there might be two or three people in it. You can't go in there, you see. We got to close those. And so uh, they use the China virus, and we see now that they don't know about the virus. We know where it came from, but as far as how to control it and what you can wear a mask, you get you get the virus. You can get shots, you get the virus. You can get boosted, you get the virus. It's just everywhere. I've known numbers of people that got the virus. They had shots, they were boosted. They had all of that. Now, I'm not saying you, you shouldn't maybe try to avoid it if you can, but still, it's a virus. It's out there, and, and they don't know. I think that's really the bottom line is, at first they said, wipe down your groceries. You know, do that kind of stuff. They had us doing all kind of things. Go to the gas pump and use an alcohol thing on the gas. All kind of things. But then they determined, well, no, the sun kills it, so that doesn't work. But again, it shows they don't really know either. But they state things as fact and thus expect everybody to accept it. And then, of course, gender science. You can choose to be what you want to be. Why, if you want to be a girl and you were born a boy, well, that's okay. You can choose to be a girl or vice versa. You can choose to be whatever you want to be. You know, it was asked when Joe Biden was running for president, he was asked by a young reporter just in the little crowd of reporters, he said, how many genders are there? And Joe said, there's three. And uh, the, I think it's a little girl asking a young lady, and she said, well, could you name them? And he just turned around and walked off. Three genders, what are they? Well, male, female, what's the third one, you see? And so we've got people today, and they say, follow the science. Well, the science says this is a boy and this is a girl, but we can't follow that science. They act as if you can change someone's DNA. You can't change your DNA. If you're born a boy, you're going to be a boy. If you're born a girl, you're going to be a girl. That's the way it is. Now, you can decide to be gay. You can decide to be a lesbian. But you're still going to be a boy or you're going to be a girl. And that's the way it is. But the same people that want us to follow all these other sciences that they say, Say a boy can become a girl and a girl can become a boy. And they're teaching that to our children. And that's where parents especially need to know. You need to know what your, teachers, your children's teachers are teaching. You need to go to them. You need to ask them what they believe. Don't expect it. We've got them in Bowling Green, I know. We've got some uh, gays and lesbians in the school system. And they're teaching that to young ch children. They're teaching you can be that, that that's acceptable, don't be ashamed of it, and things of that nature. So they're in our public schools. And it's the parents' responsibility to know what your children are being taught. And if they're being taught foolishness like that, it'd be better if they just stayed at home and didn't learn anything. 
You have to go to the teacher and ask them. Put them on the spot. What do you believe about this? What do you believe about that? Now, there are a lot of good teachers out there. Not all of them are like that. But you've got to find out who's teaching your children and what they're teaching them. Because this is being taught. It, it's getting worse in our society today. And then you ask, do they follow the science on abortion? What has science proven, if anything, about abortion? What's in the womb of that mother? Is that just some sort of mass, like a cancer that you can just cut out and dispense with? You know, I heard one fellow talk about abortion, and he, he, he was in support of abortion. And he says, you know, a, a girl going through this, she has some very difficult decisions to make if she becomes pregnant. And why is it difficult? Why is it difficult? You ever stop? Why is that a difficult decision? When the doctor told me I had cancer, it wasn't difficult at all. I said, let's cut it out. I didn't think a second about it. As soon as we can do it, let's cut it out. There wasn't anything difficult in that. You know what makes it difficult? That's a human being that's put in that womb. That's a human being with a spirit. And that's what makes it difficult. And so when they, they talk about such a difficult, you just ask, well, why is it difficult? Because it's a person in there. And yet they don't want us to follow the science on abortion. So they're using science to further their liberal Marxist views. Marx didn't believe in God. And sadly, a lot of people in our country don't believe in God as well. And, and so they're using science. They call it science. But it's not really science. They're using it to push their agenda. And their agenda is one that I believe comes straight from the devil. He's behind all of these teachings. Now, Marxism has no God but the state. The state, the government is the God under Marxism. I want to read you a quote here. This is taken from the New York Times, July the 7th, 2009. Now, this is Justice Ginsburg. She just passed away a few months ago on the Supreme Court. But it's really telling about... Uh, her thinking on abortion says, yes, the ruling about that surprised me. And that was Harris v. McRae. And in 1980, the court upheld the Hyde Amendment, which forbids the use of Medicaid for abortions. In other words, they couldn't use federal money to pay for abortions under the Hyde Amendment. And she said the ruling surprised her. And notice what it says here. Frankly, I had thought that at the time Roe was decided, there was concern about the population growth, and particularly growth in populations that we don't want to have too many of. Now let that just sink in a minute. First we're worried about population growth, so let's kill the babies. But which babies? They had in mind certain babies, and it's basically poor black babies, especially poor, but black especially as well. And of course, if you know anything about the history of abortion, Sanger, who was one of the leading proponents of abortion back in the 30s and the 40s, her idea of getting rid of people or getting rid of the undesirables in society. And if you'll notice where many abortion clinics are in our country today, they're in a lot of black neighborhoods. You ever stop and think what she said now? Particularly growth in populations that we don't want. Who's we? In other words, she puts herself in the elite class, the educated class, the, the smart class of society, and she's saying, you know, there's some populations we don't want. Well, who is it? You can see what's behind things like abortion and all. They've got other agendas behind that than just caring about what the mother's having to do. Well, notice what Paul tells Timothy over in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 20. Oh, Timothy, 
guard what was committed to your trust. That's the word of God. That's what was committed to his trust. Avoiding the profane and the idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. King James Version says science. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Faith, grace be with you. Amen. Notice what Paul warns. He says, you, you be real concerned. You be warned about what people falsely call knowledge or science. As Christians today, we have to take that warning just as well. We have to be concerned, be warned about what we are told is science today. Because much of it is false science. They're trying to get us to believe that man has the answer to everything. Don't listen to God when in fact God still has the answer. True knowledge, we look at it. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. The Bible, the Word of God, that's the truth. It's been tried. It's been tested. It is confirmed by the Holy Spirit. It is the Word of God. And so when God tells you something, you can count on that. When God says He's going to be the one that determines when this world comes to an end, that's who's going to determine it. We're not going to destroy it. Even if we tried to destroy it, we can't. We might can destroy some little part of it over here, some little part over there, but we're not going to destroy this world. God's going to determine when this world's going to be destroyed. And that's what His Word teaches us. You can believe it because it's in His Word. Over in Hebrews 11 in verse 1, He says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith. God has given us evidence in His Word. And so when we read and we study, we can learn God's Word. We can be so much more knowledgeable than people in the world because we can trust what God tells us. It is the truth and it has been proven. Hebrews 11 and verse 3 goes on, By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. In other words, God created the heavens and the earth. And He created them out of things that were not visible. We couldn't see them. They didn't even appear, but God could create them. Romans 1 in verse 19, He said, Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them, for since the creation of the world... His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. You look at all the things that were made. You look at the earth. You look at the universe. You look at the planets. You look at the perfect rotation. You look at this earth. You look at life on this earth. Everything you look at, you look at your own body. Everything you look at has design. And God's the one who designed it. It lets us know that these things just couldn't happen. You can take you a, a bunch of dynamite and go out in your backyard and you can blow it up all day long and you're not going to have anything but a mess. You're not going to create anything beautiful. You're not going to create anything like what we have when we have look at the human body or we look at life on this earth. and We look at all the different animals and how everything works together to sustain one another. You're not going to see that in an explosion. There's something behind all of it that we call the Creator. And God's clearly shown it to us. You know, you take your little iPhone and you look at your iPhone. How did that come about? Did an explosion happen in some factory somewhere? And your old dial telephone turned into an iPhone? You know, when you stop to think, does, does that indicate somebody somewhere was behind that iPhone? 
and there was somebody who knew something and they applied it and they, they worked and they learned and, and they improved it and they worked at it. No, we know there was intelligent be design behind that. And it's the way it is with everything. You look at this building. This building was built. There was design behind it. There was a builder. And, and so these things just didn't explode into existence. Well, neither did this earth and all the creation that we see. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So right there in the very beginning, he doesn't tell us how he did it. He just said, this is the way it is. God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And then you'll notice by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Verse 9 of Psalm 33 says, For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. You see, none of us, and even none of these so-called scientists around us, can conceive of someone who can just speak. And it, it appears. He speaks, and it happens. When God just says, let there be light, there was light. When God created man, he just spoke. Everything that came into existence, he spoke. I can't understand that kind of power. But that's God. And, and that's what he's showing us in his word. He created it. And how did he do it? Just by speaking. You know when the, uh, all the centurion came to Jesus and he said, you know, I have a servant and I want you to heal that servant. Jesus said, let's go. He said, no, you don't have to go. You can just speak. You can just say the word and he'll be healed. I'm a man under authority. I understand authority. And that man understood that all Jesus had to do was speak. Didn't matter where his servant was. Didn't matter how far away his servant was. That man would be healed. He spoke. And he was healed. Jesus spoke and the seas calmed. Just think of the things. When Jesus just said, it happened. That's God. God's able to speak. And so some people think, because I can't understand that, surely it couldn't happen. Surely that, there's just no way that could happen. But that's God. And that's what the scriptures tell us. We walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. That means every step that we take as Christians, as God's children, we take it by faith. The faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so we walk by faith. We believe what God tells us. And God's right. He's been right. Every single thing he said in the Bible has come true. God is right. You think about salvation. If God's right about all those other things, then God's going to be right about salvation. You know, it's God who's going to determine who goes to heaven and who doesn't. God wants everyone to go to heaven. That's God's desire, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. He wants to save all men. And so God sent his son to die so that we could be free from sin. Now that's God's plan. Again, man doesn't understand God's plan. Man doesn't understand the idea of someone having to come from heaven, come to this earth and die, shed his blood. That doesn't make sense to a lot of people. So uh, they just don't give any credence to it at all. But God didn't design this so that we could understand everything. God designed it so that if we believe him and we obey him, We'll be saved. What we have to do is humble ourselves and accept what God teaches in His Word. That's what it boils down to. I've got to say God is right and I need to be led by God. That if, if His Word differs from what I think or what somebody's taught me, God is still right. Now you look at it. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. How do we know anything about God? It's revealed in the Bible. You talk about these people in denominational churches. And they'll say, I believe in Jesus. Where would they learn about Jesus? Well, they had to learn about him in the Bible. 
Well, do you believe what Jesus says? Not do you believe in Jesus. Do you believe what Jesus says? Now think about that. Because if you believe in Jesus, but you don't believe in what he says, then you don't really believe Jesus. Not really. We look over at John chapter 12 and verse 48. It's an important passage about our salvation because Jesus tells us what we're going to be judged by. He says in John 12, 48, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Now notice, if I don't accept the words of Jesus, if I don't believe in his words, if I don't obey his words, I'm going to lose my soul. It's not just enough to say, well, I believe in Jesus. I have to believe in what Jesus says. And it, if it contradicts what my grandmother taught me, or if it contradicts what some pastor tells me, well, then they're wrong. Because the words of Jesus are right. That's what's been confirmed by the Holy Spirit. And so faith comes by hearing, but it's hearing by the Word of God. John 8, verse 24, Jesus said, If you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. You must absolutely believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the truth. And there's a lot of people who don't believe that. There's some that say they do, but they don't, believe what he, they don't do what He says. And, and so they don't really believe in Jesus. And so you've got to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then in Matthew 10 and verse 32, Jesus said, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. I have to have enough courage to let other people know that I believe that Jesus is the Christ. And if I shrink back, if I'm a coward, and I won't speak up for the Lord, and I won't confess my faith to others, he says in that same passage, he will deny me before his Father. So I have to have the courage to confess my faith to others, to let them know I believe in Jesus. And then Luke 13, 3 tells, says me, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now that step right there is where many people falter. They could go along with belief, they can go along with confession, but repentance. You, you mean I got to give up my beer? Yeah, 1 Peter 4, 3 says you've got to give up your beer. You mean I've got to give up my gambling? Yep, you've got to give up your gambling. That's a work of the flesh. You mean I've got to give up my adulterous mate? Yep, Matthew 19, 9 says if you want to go to heaven, you can't be in adultery. You see, you've got to repent. And that's where many people who believed in Jesus quit following him. Matthew 11, verse 20 said there were many. They saw the miracles, but they would not repent a lot of people just don't want to give up their sin whatever their sin happens to be whatever sin they love they have pleasure in that unrighteousness they're not willing to give it up and God said if you don't repent you will likewise perish and then Mark 16 16 he who believes and is baptized will be saved but he who does not believe will be condemned Oh, preacher, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. What did Jesus say? What did Jesus say? He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Now, if you want to be condemned, just don't believe. Just don't believe what Jesus says, and you'll be condemned. But if you want to be saved, you're going to have to obey the Lord. Now, I didn't write that. That's what the Lord said. Mark wrote it. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, we see that Luke wrote what Peter said, and Peter was guided by the Holy Spirit. When he was asked, what shall we do by these sinners in Jerusalem, he said, you need to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What do you need to do? You need to repent and be baptized. You see, they were already believers. At that point, they were pricked. They were convinced Jesus was the Son of God. And what did they need to do? Repent and be baptized. Why? 
for the remission of sins in order to be saved. That's what the Lord said. Now, if you want to go to heaven, you're going to have to obey the Lord. It's not this church. We didn't write that. We, we obeyed what the Lord told us to do, but we didn't write it. And it's not what some of my family members practice. I've got family members didn't practice this. They don't practice it today. It's, it doesn't change what God says. You know, I had a grandmother, a good woman, good in many respects, but she died in a denominational church. She didn't obey this. No matter how good she was, it didn't change this. This is what the Lord said. And John 12, 48 says, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. Now, if you want to be saved, you're going to have to obey this plan. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, if you're here tonight, we want you to follow the truth. We could call it science because it's true science. It's true knowledge. Follow what you can read in your Bible. We don't ask anybody to do anything except what they can read in their Bible. You're obeying the Lord. You're not obeying me. You're not obeying anybody in this group. You're obeying the Lord when you follow the Bible. And then go teach other people to do the same thing, to do just what you did. And if you're here and you're a child of God and there's sin in your life, the Bible teaches in Acts chapter 8 and 1 John chapter 1 that we need to repent of that sin and we need to confess that to the Lord and pray and the Lord will forgive us. So those who are in the family of God have access to God through prayer and when we sin, we need to confess that to the Lord and repent of it and the Lord will forgive us. So if you're here tonight, you're subject to the invitation of our Lord. We urge you, don't put it off. Don't wait. You need to obey the gospel tonight. Won't you come right now while we stand and while we sing?